Once again, it's good to be back with everybody in the midst of this busy week. And we want to continue on with our study of uh, First John. As we left off in our last time together, we were seeing that John was telling those Christians who he wants to have fellowship with God, even as the apostles and God are in fellowship. And he wants them to have their joy full. He wants them to truly understand what fellowship with God is and what fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ means. And thus he's talked much about if you love God, and he'll develop this further in later chapters, then uh, you're going to love your brothers and sisters in Christ. You can't declare honestly that you love your brothers and sisters in Christ and yet not love God. But the evidence of loving God is keeping his commandments. That the Christian's mind is set upon not sin. He's a new creature in Christ. And as we grow, and he addresses that, growing in knowledge and practice of the truth, therefore, and the likeness of Christ, he talks about how that the word of God is the source of the strength whereby the Christian is to live. There's where the instruction from God comes from and from nowhere else. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, and 2 Timothy 2, 15, James 1, 25. Um, that doesn't rule out prayer because the Bible teaches about prayer. It doesn't rule out anything that God does on our behalf in a providential way because the Bible teaches that God providentially cares for his children and it makes it clear that the place he's located all spiritual blessings in heavenly places is in Christ Ephesians 1 verse 3 but he then talks about not loving the world and that's where we were last week uh, love not the world neither the things that are in the world if any man love the world the love of the father is not in him we spent some time to point out that he's not talking about loving the world as the Father did to send the Son to save it. That's talking about people who have sinned and by that sin separated themselves from God and that they have not the power singularly or in group or any other thing pertaining to uh, God's creation uh, that can save them. So they couldn't save themselves. God therefore offered the plan through Christ one of the Godheads, the second person of the Godhead to come to earth as a man and live as a man without sinning, though he was tempted in every point like as we are. And thus, through his death, he made peace uh, with us and with God through our belief in him and compliance with his gospel, which is God's power to save us, Romans 1, 16. God's writing to the people who've done that. Well, it becomes very obvious, it needs to be emphasized, that any doctrine that teaches that a child of God can sin as much as he or she wants to and not fall from the grace of God, it's just false doctrine. Now, one simple way to understand that is that truth does not imply error. And since the Bible is very plain on this business of one must will to be faithful as the new testament teaches being faithful in the church then if somebody comes along and says well uh, you are saved and therefore you can't be lost well that implies a lot of things it just teaches contrary to the plain teachings of the bible explicitly just so many words and implicitly a child of god can so sin as be eternally lost now john addresses that he makes it clear, don't ever reach the stage to where you say, well, I don't have any sin. He makes it clear that our sins are covered by the blood of the Lamb because we are faithful. 1 John 1, 7 and 1 Corinthians 15, 58, a good definition of what it is to be a faithful child of God. So he turns around and giving emphasis to this. Let me say it again, as I have many more times I can remember, that there were no book chapter numbers and verses it was just a letter, so the Holy Spirit through John, as he did the other inspired writers, is developing this letter uh, for the reasons we've already noticed. 
And we've seen then that he wants them to understand that this world that he speaks of, that Christians are out to love, has nothing to do with people who need salvation. Well, the church is expected to love them, being the spiritual body of Christ, and to carry out the Great Commission in teaching them God's power to save them, that is, teaching them the gospel. So what is he talking about? Well, he says, for all that's in the world, verse 15, for all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Then he said, in the world uh, passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now, if you think about it, that sums up the reason that you have all these letters written to Christians. People who have already had their past sins remitted when they, as penitent believers, were baptized into Christ for the remission of their sins. The Lord added in the church, Acts 2, 47. And then what? Well, John is one of those books, as most of the New Testament is, that is, then what? John telling them then what? He's telling them what to do. He's telling them what they not what they're not to do, what they're to do and what they're not to do. Now, this is not the only place that we find what he means by the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. If you look over in Paul's writings to the Galatians, in Galatians chapter 5, he will address the churches of Galatia. And remember, God wrote the Bible. So the same Holy Spirit that inspired the Apostle John to write to Christians concerning how to remain in fellowship with God and enjoy the fellowship that the Apostles and God had is doing the same thing in the, to the Church of Galatia, that is the Apostle Paul. Paul, an apostle, had the same connection and fellowship with God that John did. And so whatever he writes by inspiration of the Spirit to Christians is designed to help them be faithful to also have this joy, to understand the fellowship of God's children, members of the church with God, and to one another. And so he declares here in uh, chapter 5, and I'll be reading from the American Standard 1901 version, now the works of the flesh are manifest. Let us stop there for a moment. Manifest means made known. They're recognizable. You can identify them. Now when John says, uh, don't love the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. American Sanders says vain glory of life. Then he's talking about all these things Paul lists here as works of the flesh. Notice they are fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, sorcery. He goes on to say enmities, which means hate, strife, jealousy, wrath, factions, divisions, parties, envy, drunkenness, reveling, and such like. Now watch what he says. It says like John, of which I forewarn you, even as I did forewarn you, that they who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, John says it this way, the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God about it forever. Well, who's doing the will of God? Those faithful members or citizens of the kingdom of God. Same kind of people that Paul addressed. They were Christians. They all became Christians the same way, believing and practicing the same thing, obeying the same gospel, God's power to save them from their sin, Romans 1, 16. So we need to realize that kind of thing. Uh, in studying other passages, now we could relate and go on to even more, uh, and see how people who are attached to this world tend to think. Now, when you think of the lust of the flesh, the word lust nowadays uh, is usually used to mean an unlawful gratification of some appetite of the flesh. Well, unlawful, what does that mean? Contrary to the law of God, contrary to the will of God as to how we are to live what we're to think about, what we're to give up, and so forth. And so you have these things listed here. Well, I think it's interesting to note that you have these 
sins that are mentioned in Galatians 5 uh, broken down in categories that you, you can see where they belong. If you're talking about sexually, you're talking about fornication, adultery, and uh, lasciviousness fits in there. And let me mention fornication for a moment. Fornication comes from the Greek word pornea, which means any sexual relations outside of marriage. Well, that's important to understand. Now, people who are married, in Matthew 19, 6, God joined marriage. When one of them commits fornication, then it's adultery because that person has had sexual relations with someone he's not authorized to, or she, as the case may be. You're authorized by the Lord to have sexual relations with your scriptural spouse. So it adulterates the marriage to have sexual relationship or to fornicate with somebody else. Well, that's what's being considered here, and it covers then all illicit sexual relations. Then you've got socially hatred, you've got contentions, you've got jealousies, all of that enters into the whole thing. And these uh, have to do with, shall we say, unlawful longing of things that we may not even be able to see, but we long after. Uh, we read a book. We read the newspaper, we watch television, we watch movies, we look on the online, we see all this thing, and it causes us as children of God to lust after these things. That's exactly what's meant. Um, and that's where all of our evil comes from in our own personal lives, is to desire these things. So you see, the battle begins in the mind. Thus, we have such teachings as set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. And as Paul said, he sought to bring every thought into subjection to Christ. David said, I've, I've, hit, uh, I've, I've hid thy word in thy heart, my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Heart, mind. So the battle begins in the mind. Well, when you study the scriptures, you're studying the mind of Christ. And when you see from the revealed mind of Christ, how he wills that his children are to live, then you don't uh, lust, desire, uh, those things that are not going to have to go to heaven. If you read James, and we won't right now, but I urge you to do so, you'll see how it works. The lust leads to the action, to basically put it in that way. And if you look at Mother Eve in the very beginning, one commandment, Forbidden fruit from a certain tree. She knew the commandment. And the very one who tempted her and deceived her and got her to violate God's commandment and get her husband to do it, she's the one that, uh, he's the one that she could tell exactly what God told her to do. But the flesh entered in and her desires entered in. And notice the desires of the mind as well as the flesh. And that's important to understand because I think that what happens many times um, is that people in the church sometimes zero in more on how terrible, terrible, terrible homosexuality is, how terrible, terrible, terrible adultery is, and any kind of fornication. So, well, that's right. It is. It's terrible. And uh, Paul said in Galatians 5, you do those things, you won't go to heaven. And they're works of the flesh. But I don't know that I hear that much about people getting upset over the private life, do you? Uh, I don't know that I hear that much about people getting all upset over the lust of the eye. But I do hear people still, though not enough, but I'm talking about our brothers and sisters in Christ, who really get upset over the lust of the flesh. Uh, so... We would do well to remember that the lust of the flesh refers to our longings after things, what we can see. And it can develop into envy, it can develop into jealousy, it can certainly help form covetousness and all that kind of thing. And I guess we could say that the modern day expression could be just 
simply materialism. And those things are condemned. I won't take the time to read it, but I urge you to write it down now and uh, look at Ephesians 5, 5 through 7, regarding the matter of the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, uh, being the world of which John says we are not to partake, Ephesians 5, 5 through 7, and then put right alongside that Colossians chapter 3, also verses 5 through 7, Colossians 3, verses 5 through 7. So that's, you'll see from those verses, this is about as serious as it gets when it comes to being mindful of them, that we might walk the straight and narrow way of divine truth. Pride of life, the vain glory of life. What is that based on? Well, it can be based upon age, can be based upon experience, can be based upon ancestry, uh, can be based upon past accomplishments, uh, certainly can be based upon money and position and power. But if you look over in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, the first Corinthians chapter one, verses 26 through 31. I won't read that one either. First Corinthians 1, 26 through 31. But Paul points out that not many mighty or noble, as American Standard says, of this world, of this world, we're all of this world. But now Paul's using it like John does in not loving the world, the people who care for this world. People like that have pleasure in unrighteousness. A lot of times we don't understand that. We tend to answer all people as to what must they be saved on the basis of if, if they really um, are interested. They're just desiring truly to know God's will. Well, it's wonderful to come across people like that. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're all out there. Have you noticed when Paul is writing to the Thessalonians in Second Thessalonica, I mean Thessalonians, he says in chapter 2 and verse 10 regarding when a great apostasy will take place, what must happen for it to take place. He says in verse 10, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Now watch it. Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. You see, we address most people as if they all love the truth and they're just designed to understand it, go to heaven. There's a whole host of folks out there who are in love with the world. They love it. Even the writer of Hebrews calls it because of the pleasure of sin for a season. When he talks about Moses choosing not to do that, not to have those things, but to suffer affliction with God's people. So when we preach the gospel to people, when we deal with people, it's wonderful to come across somebody that, that wants to love it, that loves the truth, and is trying to learn it, trying to obey it. But Paul wrote the church here, thus he's writing them about living a Christian life, that their joy may be full. But they may have fellowship with God and with one another as the apostles did. And he says, there are folks that won't love the truth. Now watch what he what he says in verse 11. Second Thessalonians 2 verse 11. And for this cause, what cause? What cause? They don't love the truth. What's going to happen? God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned to believe not the truth. Now watch it. But have pleasure in unrighteousness. Now let you think about that for a minute. That's a letter written to Christians too. So that they could have their joy full and remain in fellowship with God. Be faithful to it. But look at really what's being said there. People don't understand maybe verse 11. Because they don't love the truth. God sends them a strong delusion. Well, May I remind you that in interpreting Scripture, things can be said about God that he actually and directly does certain things. Other things are said that he did them when he allowed them to happen. 
Now, you won't understand some scriptures if you don't understand those two things. God does directly operate, and he does indirectly operate. But in this case right here, what's being said is, if you have pleasure in unrighteousness, if you do not love the truth, if you love pleasure, then the very fact that you do that places you in a position to believe a lie. Here's why. There's only two courses out there, the truth and a lie. Which one do you love? You either love the truth supremely or you love a lie and thus you're deceived. This is a very important point to keep in mind as we bring this one over to connect with what John's saying because they all have the same end in mind. If God wrote the Bible, most of the New Testament's written to Christians to keep them faithful, then Paul and John both have the same thing in mind. To love the world is to simply enjoy the appetites of the flesh and, in, and and seek after them, whether it be the lust of the flesh, whether it be the lust of the eye, or the pride of vain glory of life, or all three of them. Uh, and I think probably wicked men, worldly people, worldly-minded people, are involved in one the other and all of them. But why won't some people listen to the truth? They don't love it. Why should be be so surprised that there that there are people who don't love the truth? Now, what's going to happen to them if they don't? I can tell you. Did it develop with me or come from any other men? No. God just told us right here. If they don't love the truth and they have pleasure in righteousness, they're going to be deluded. They're going to run after a lie. Now, look around about you. Look at this nation right now. There was a time when more of the population of this nation, when, of course, the nation was much smaller in population than it is now, that there were more people out there that were in love with the truth. They might be in error. They might be believing some false doctrine. But when you dealt with them from the Bible that they claim was the word of God, then they were more teachable. Now, you take Luke 8 and verse 15 when you look at the soils and it all represents different mindsets, different mental uh, conditions, and I don't mean that insanity, but just simply minds that are ready to receive the truth or minds that receive it and won't keep it or minds that don't receive it. If you look at 815, you can see a person must have, must, it's imperative, have an honest and good heart or the word of God won't do somebody any good that does it. So you're, you're dealing with that. And when we go to preach the gospel and when we get concerned about saving souls, you have to go and try in dealing with everybody to teach them the truth. But it won't take you very long to learn if they love the truth if they don't. And they don't have to be rank atheists or in some religion that has nothing to do with God and Christ and the Bible. Because they're not going to listen. They're not going to follow the whole counsel of God. And that's a point that needs to be made here. When you study about love, not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in it. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away and the lust thereof. Now think about that for a minute. The last few verses. The world passes away in the lust thereof. Most people in this world are building their hopes and aspirations and dreams and setting their affections on that which is going to cease. Let's say, let's take what we all understand to be a bad thing, at least I believe on, on this in this class they would. Let's just take fornication, which is rampant in this world we live in. Here's a man that has not cared anything other than to commit fornication any way to him. He doesn't care about what God says about it or anybody else says about it if it prohibits him from doing that. Then he dies. There's no longer even appetite for that. That left with the flesh. And now he's in torment because of the way he dealt with the appetite of the flesh here. He did not try to curb them 
by obeying the will of God. He didn't love the truth. He loved pleasure. But now that's what we readily see. What about the covetous person? A person just, he, might, he may never have attained it, but he has spent his life trying to have all he can get of this world's good. So when he dies and he's all up behind whether he had little or much, he steps completely out of a realm where anything like that even is in the body and there's no need for it because he's left the flesh. But then to tear it, tear it over even further, at the end of the world, there won't be any of these things. That's what John's saying. Why build your hopes, aspirations, dreams, and plans up on those particular matters? Doesn't make a lot of sense. And what about age and experience and ancestry and past accomplishments and money and position and power? All those things. What what is that going to get you to their judgment? You won't even have an appetite for those things. So we need not to be caught up in the wisdom of this world. That's what Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 and 31. The wisdom of this world is caught up in all these things. That's the reason not many mighty men, according to this world definition of mighty, is even interesting here in the Bible. Uh, each of these things Three things, less the flesh, less the eyes, part of life. May hit us at different phases of our life, some of them more than others. I would say that overall, young people are most affected by the lust of the flesh. I would say that roughly, and I'm saying roughly, deliberately that middle age people are to a great extent probably have emphasized in their life the lust of the eyes and then when it comes down to aged people uh, maybe the pride of life the thing goes, look look at me you can't tell me anything i already know it you haven't been where i've been well it's interesting that in every one of those things that is phases or categories or whatever, that um, John addresses here with the different degrees of knowledge and practice and maturity in the kingdom. But he answers wherever you are in the kingdom and your growth and development, a baby in Christ, whether you're a young person, spiritually speaking, or an older person, spiritually speaking, Speaking of father, as he calls them, maturing Christ, the battle's still the same as far as the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, listed in Ephesians 6, charge of the preparation of the gospel of peace, and so on. You still have that armor on. And as the old saying goes, you don't take that armor off until you leave this world. So there's always room as long as your mind works correctly and you're accountable to God for your thoughts and actions by the by faith. Well, how do you do that? It's seeking to bring all these things in subjection to Jesus Christ. Well, how do you find out how to do that? Preach the word. You mention and see an attitude, approve, rebuke, enjoy, all long suffering and doctrine. Well, you say that's preaching it to somebody else. Well, you better preach it to yourself like that first. Or you won't be qualified to preach to anybody else. Examine yourself to see whether you be in the thing. So I don't know how a person can be faithful to God and not be preaching to himself or herself regarding how they need to think, speak, and live. When Paul spoke to the Ephesian elders, he first said, before you take heed to the church, he said, take heed to yourself and to all the church over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseer." presbyters, shepherds, elders. He also told Timothy that as a preacher, take heed to yourself and to the doctor. It all begins with taking heed to ourselves. You became a Christian if you are one because you took heed to yourself. Numero uno, you. You were concerned about your own personal relationship with God. And by the gospel, you recognize you don't have one. You're cut off. You're separated. You're lost. Only Christ through the gospel can save you. 
All right, that's happened with these people. Thus, once you get on the baptized side of things, having believed and repented in, of your sin, then you can see there's something else still to do. Uh, I think sometimes uh, there's a tendency, as I said earlier, and I want to emphasize that again, a tendency to make some of these things more serious than others, but they're all equally serious. Um, I ask the question, which is worse, fornication or covenant? They're all on the same list as far as God's concerned, as far as them keeping you out of heaven if you're guilty of it. Which do we consider more serious, adultery or jealousy? One's bad as the other as far as keeping you out of heaven. So if we're not careful, and underscore that word careful, full of care, while fighting a right battle and a strong battle against immorality, materialism and pride may sneak in, come right in the back door and we don't even see it, or we're so hard against something else. We are, as human beings, prone to have our favorite this, that, or the other. But the same thing's true when it comes down to sin. We can be very particular about some sins and not pay much attention about others. And that's a danger. The uh, Bible doesn't teach anything like that. And we've got to be careful lest we fall into that particular matter. So we've noticed other passages then that teach us, such as Galatians 5, 19 through 21, the details of the works of the flesh that arise from the lust of the flesh. But in our lesson, John gives us another reason because of what loving the world does. Look in the latter part of, of uh, verse 15. Back over there in my Bible. The latter part of verse 15. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I think about that for a minute, but let's see here. Then the men love the world, think of what we said about what the world is. The love of the Father's mother. You can't have your mind dominated by the things of this present age and the appetites of the body you live in. You can't have it dominated by those things and you're seeking after those things and have the love of the Father in you. I think I've been around brethren who thought they could, could try to do that. But, you know, I don't have to know all they're doing or what they're not doing. But if they love this present world, and that tells us something about Demas. Remember, Paul said, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Question. Was it fornication, adultery, covetousness, jealousy, faction? What was it? that he loved. I don't know. But that's found right here in Galatians 5 and in uh, 1 John. He loved the world. The love of the Father couldn't have been in him then. So if you fill your mind with these things, then it's impossible to love the Father like John's talking about. So here's, there's, you know, a check and balance system that's being set out here. Um, I understand the love of the Father means love for the Father. I, I think that's what's being talked about. And instead of the father, Father's love for us, for we know, well, take Romans 5 and verse 8, that he loves us even when we were sinners. He loved us, sent his son to die for us. Romans 5, verse 8. But John's not the only person to say that if we love the world, we cannot love God. The two won't go together. It just won't work. James taught in James 4 and verse 4 basically the same thing. That friendship with the world is enmity with God, hate with God. Now we have a definition of the world. And we're not to love it because we can't love God and love that. We can't give our lives over to the lust of the flesh, lust of God, and the vainglory of life. Expect us to love God. 
like we must if heaven is to be our home. Jesus taught it while he was on the earth, and really all these verses are just expounding and on what Jesus taught. In Matthew 6, verse 24, he made it very clear that we can't serve two masters. But there's still a host of people who think themselves very stalwart members of the church who are trying to do that, but it won't work. Now, notice the context of Matthew 6, 24. That's part of the Sermon on the Mount. Just a few verses later, that he says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So he's saying that if you serve me first, foremost, and always, you'll get through life. God will take care of you. We even have a song that reminds us of that. God will take care of you. Why do we sing it? What do we get out of it? Well, it certainly means that we ought to love God with all that we ought to have. So our sinful pride may rebel against uh, this thought, but that means only that we have it, we ought to get rid of it. We're simply not able to love the world and God at the same time. You can't do it. Now, let's see a little further as time allows as to why this is the case. You may have already figured it out yourself, but I'm trying to lead us on here. Notice the definition of the love of the Father. Definition of the love of the Father. The question, that comes down then to the question, what does it really mean to love the Father? Well, we've already pointed out several times, and I guess we'll get there at some point, but right now, I've used this in many sermons over the years to make a point. In 1 John 5 and verse 3, the Apostle John writes, For this is the love of God. I've usually in sermons said, do you want to see the love of God? Well, I think we all would say yes. Well, John says, for this is the love of God. And the next question is, well, what, John, is the love of God? And he says that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Some people say, well, they seem rather grievous to me. When you understand that everything God obligates us to do in the Bible is for our own good, then even when you don't see certain things about the discharging of that obligation that is being faithful in that particular area, you know it's for your good. There are a host of things when it comes to infants, babies, little children that they just don't see the need of. But parents who are supposedly mature enough to be parents mentally and in learning will take those children and make them do things they don't want to and don't see the need of doing. It. Even when their children as little say, well, you're mean to me, mama. They overlook all that. Parents who love their children do. So parents, they have as human beings have enough common sense to see that they deal with their infants and babies and children, doing things with them and to them that the children don't see the reason for it and don't even want to do it, but the parents see that they do. Then surely our Heavenly Father can see things that we need that we don't understand why, but you see in faith because we know who he is. We trust him. We step out and go ahead and do what he said, even when it's distasteful to us many times. When over in 2 Kings 5, and I'll close after this with a prayer, in 2 Kings 5, Naaman, the leper, great man, according to the ideas of this world, learned the will of God concerning being cleansed of his lepers. They didn't suit him at first, and of course the servant reasoned with him that he was prepared to do some great things, the world finds great, so how much more now that he's asked you to go get seven pounds in the Jordan, will not you go ahead and do it? Well, he calmed himself down, and he went and dipped seven times in the river Jordan. 
Well, now think about that for a minute. Think about what that means when it comes to our knowing what the Word of God says, but I, I don't see why. All I have to know is God loves me. God gave his son to die for me. And this is what he has told me to do. Now, the only answer I have for that is if you love God, if you'll keep his commandments, and you'll have the attitude to speak, Lord, thy servant here, command, and I will obey. Let's bow for a word of prayer, please. Our Holy Father, again, we approach thy glorious throne to hallow thy name, to thank thee for this time together in which we search the scripture, to learn more of what it is to be righteous before thee and to be truly a child of God. Help us realize that this is the way that thou hast chosen that we grow up in Christ, become more Christ-like, have the attitude of Christ. May we put these things into practice. Bless us a good night of rest. And may we so live that heaven will be our home. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.